Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button below. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au. Welcome to this Australian Water School webinar brought to you by Icewarm. This webinar series aims to bring you the many innovative ideas and projects coming from the global water sector. And today we're going to look at one very important idea. And by the look of the number of people here, it's pretty important. It's called dam breach modelling by three professionals in this area, Bill Syme, Chris Goodell and Cray Price. Today's presenters and uh, they're uh, Bill Syme, Chris Goodell and Cray Price, um, all three deeply involved with modelling. Uh, two flow in, in Bill Symes' case and uh, Chris Goodell uh, and Cray have been uh, certainly in, into HECRAS. Um, Bill's had 30 years experience, I won't read the whole thing, riverine, estuarine and coastal studies um, and most have been in the field of flood hydraulics and Chris Goodell is a consultant for hydraulics and hydrology at Klein Smith Associates, specialises in water resources hydraulic engineering and Cray Price, educated at University of California, Berkeley, is a civil engineer project manager with international experience. It is going to be a feast. I can tell you that right now. Are you there, guys? Uh, let's uh, see your great faces on screen. If you've got, there we go. Good old Bill uh, up in Brisbane, Queensland, Cray in WA, and Chris Goodell on the west coast of the uh, US. Thank you yep. so much for joining us, gentlemen, and taking the time to do this together. So I'm going to let Craig, Craig kick this off and, and moderate, and uh, then we'll go straight to um, to Chris and then straight to Bill. So over to you, gentlemen. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Uh, we are looking forward to this uh, time together. Great. Okay. Um, thanks. I'll kick this off. All right. So, um, so maybe quite not uh, not quite as heroic as um, <clears throat> as these guys, but I'll introduce our dam busters for today. Um, this will be um, over to. Um, Chris, uh, myself, and Bill, we've divided this geographically. Um, I am curious, can you see my mouse when I move my mouse with yep. that, that button yep. there? Okay. Yeah, that's so all good. That way okay. I'll get to highlight things with yep. my pointer. Um, basically, we're dividing this geographically into three reaches. I will be talking uh, about a couple of basic um, items about the reservoir drawdown, how we simulate a reservoir. Chris will talk about the dam itself, how we model the breach parameters, and Bill will talk about um, how that flood wave is routed downstream. Um, this is just a basic profile, but um, if we take a look at um, a movie screenshot, if we could render things this well, um, I will be talking about the reservoir, how it draws down. Uh, Chris will talk about the dam breach itself, and Bill will talk about the flood routing. Um, <clears throat> Now, these are just a few uh, shots just so we can get a feel for what we are talking about. It should look this exciting, but when we do 1D and 2D models, um, you know, we are depth averaged. We won't quite be able to do this um, unless you're getting into full um, computational fluid dynamics models, which um, you can see some uh, pretty cool videos of some of those. But you can see the reservoir drawdown right there. That's what I'll be, uh, I'll be discussing. Um, we will um, then get into some of the 1D items, um, which is like you see at the top there, the reservoir or, or the dam breach formation. Um, and then when we uh, get down into the flood wave, we'll talk about the things specifically, like you see Superman here, uh, trying to uh, outrun the flood wave there. How fast does that flood wave propagate downstream? How long do you have uh, before you need to evacuate? What are the different modeling parameters that feed into that? Now, I'll kick this off then just for a couple of minutes. Um, I, I'm going to keep my bit fairly short because I'm going to just talk about one thing that's a little bit boring on the dam breach modeling side of things, and that's the reservoir. So if you look at Homer here, the question is, do his toes get wet before his belly if they're at the same level? If you pull the plug, what happens? And if you think about this in a uh, modeling sense, you know, what are the parameters that drive this? What is it sensitive to? Does this drop as a level pool? Does everything drop? Um, everybody, you know, does he get, uh, get his toes and his belly exposed at the same time? Or because his toes are closer to the drain, do they get exposed first? And that's going to depend, of course, on the size of the plug. How you open the plug, do you open it slowly or quickly? Is it a big drain, a little drain? How is the um, bathtub configured? Is it long or is it uh, narrow or is it uh, just straight? If it's just uh, dropping as a level pool, it becomes a very simple exercise. Um, you can define this with a stage versus discharge rating curve, basically, and then take that and turn it into a stage versus storage curve that has your bathymetry built into it, and you can make it actually into a 0D, no dimension, no time dimension at all, um, item. That can be a stage storage curve that you can run in a one model. Basically, the reservoir, um, if you're 
discharging a certain rate of, uh, of discharge out of it um, or into it, and you multiply that by the time step, you get a volume. And that volume, uh, what happens if you're dropping as a level pool, is that it occurs all at once, meaning you, know, you could have a 10 kilometer long reservoir, you drop a drop of water into one end of it, the other end reacts instantaneously. Um, the stage storage curve uh, reacts instantaneously. And we talked about a little bit about how the shape makes a difference of Homer's bathtub. Well, the shapes are actually very complicated. Um, in our exercise, this is one of the things we're going to use in the upcoming course in March, uh, is Grand Canyon. We've got Lake Powell up at the top, Lake Mead at the other end, and um, Glen Canyon Dam and Hoover Dam, and we're going to put a dam right in the middle. And look at the complex shape of this reservoir. Um, you know, how do you define that? Uh, in our course, we'll go ahead and talk about the reservoir shape and a few of these in there and these are just some terrain files that I've built very simply to show the same volume configured a couple of different ways and then we'll run that through a few different ways and see what happens to the the flood wave as it goes through if it is a long reservoir um, and everything is in line um, you get a quite different reaction to the case where you've got a you know kind of more of a square or a circular reservoir and on profile you'll notice a few things that you can model now again our question is does this behave and drop as a level pool, meaning every time you take a certain amount of flow out of it, the pool drops together, or does it drop dynamically? And here's a case where this is where I've got the square reservoir that I just showed you, and um, it, it drops fairly evenly. Um, you look at that uh, pool in the upstream end, and the level on one end is pretty much the same as the level on the other end. Um, turn that around, though, and here I've got um, Lake Powell falling into this new dam we've built in the middle of the Grand Canyon, and you can see this shock wave going back and forth as the, uh, the breach of, uh, of the Glen Canyon Dam um, sends a shockwave up against our new dam, and you can actually watch it oscillate back and forth. And this is one that I've modeled, again, just as a big linear function. It's basically like a flume in a lab. <clears throat> But you can see initially, you'll bounce back and forth, and there are dynamic functions that can only be modeled when you take um, some of the inertial terms and momentum into effect and watch that energy go back and forth. You wouldn't see those in some of the simplifications, and you obviously wouldn't see those in a 1D model that's just based on stage and storage. But then as it drops and as this breach forms, you'll notice then all of a sudden you get to a case where it flattens out. And in that case, it doesn't matter. You could save yourself all the computational time in the world. You could model it with 1-meter grids or 10-centimeter grids or 10 you know, even a one kilometer grids in some cases and get the same answer because it's going to drop according to these equations that you could just put into a spreadsheet basically. So that's the bit that I wanted to talk about with the upstream reservoir modeling, um, level pool versus dynamic. We'll get into much more of that in our upcoming course. Um, and Chris actually has a paper. I'll try and uh, while we're talking here, I will uh, uh, pop that into uh, um, into one of the chat windows so that you can download Chris's paper, which is available online, um, that talks a little bit about that. So Chris, um, you know, feel free to mention and go back into any of these things that you like, but um, I will turn this then back over to the center part here, which is um, Chris uh, talking about the dam breach modeling parameters. So thanks for that. Yeah, thank you, Cray. Um, yeah, let me start uh, my presentation here. And uh, first, I want to uh, thank you, Cray, for that great introduction on uh, level pool versus dynamic routing. A uh, very important piece of this uh, overall dam breach uh, modeling venture that we're uh, talking about today. Um, but what I'm going to focus on now is um, the dam itself. How do we determine the amount of flow that's going to come out of the dam? What, uh, what, what do we use to determine the size of the breach and how fast does it form and um, the overall shape of it? Um, so I'm going to get into that and, and I hope if nothing else that you get out of this talk here, my, my part of the talk is that these parameters are very uncertain. We really don't know what we're going to get and these are just means for us to estimate. Um, so Conservativeness is a big deal here. Uh, we like looking at worst case scenarios, but I also want to introduce at the end the concept of probabilistic dam breach modeling as well. So what's the reason, what is the purpose for determining breach parameters? Well, what we're trying to do is develop a breach outflow hydrograph that we're then gonna ultimately route downstream, and that's gonna help us determine flood inundation, how fast the flood wave gets to diff different parts uh, of the downstream reach, and ultimately, what are the consequences? What are the damages? Now, there's several options we can use to do this uh, from simple to more detailed. Uh, the most simplest approach is 
to use a parametric equation for peak discharge. And there's several of these that are available out there. It just takes a quick Google search to find some of them. But you can use that to determine the peak discharge coming out of the dam and use a formation time equation to determine the duration of the hydrograph. Now that's gonna work uh, primarily in more level pool type um, drawdowns, smaller reservoirs, more compact reservoirs, longer reservoirs, the formation time that you get from the, the uh, breach parameter equations is not gonna work so well. But regardless, you come up with a peak discharge, uh, a duration, and that provides you with a nice triangular, simplistic breach hydrograph that you can route downstream. There are also physically based breach models out there, actual software that you can run, and it will determine the breach hydrograph. I'll show you a few of those in a little bit. And then finally, and this is probably the most commonly used, is uh, parametric equations to determine the size, shape, and formation time of the breach itself. And then you can in input that breach into your model, into your routing model, and you can watch it grow over time, and, and the model itself will compute the discharge hydrograph coming out of the breach. Most importantly, you need to know what type of dam you're breaching. Uh, there's several different types of dams out there, and they will breach differently for sure. Uh, when you're talking about a concrete gravity dam, you've got a dam that's held in place purely by its own weight. It's just a mass of concrete that's sitting there, um, and that's all that's holding back the water is the mass of the, of the dam itself. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are concrete arch dams. Arch dams are typically very thin, and uh, they're held in place by the arching effects and translating the force of the reservoir into the abutments. Embankment dams are made out of erodible material. It could be earth, it could be rock, it could be a combination of the two. They may have an internal clay core. Uh, there's several different ways you can construct these, but these dams are going to erode when they're overtopped. Or you might have a combination dam. Uh, it may have elements of two or more of these uh, different types of dams in there. Here's an example at the bottom of the Dalles Dam in uh, Oregon, and it's got an embankment dam um, on the lower portion of the photograph, followed by a, a gravity dam powerhouse, and then uh, going transverse across the river is a uh, gravity dam spillway. And so they're a combination of dams, so you have to sometimes look at multiple different failure locations and see which one is going to be the controlling failure. Now with concrete gravity dams, as I mentioned before, they're held in place sheerly by their own weight and they're typically composed of multiple monoliths. Okay, so it's not a single mass of concrete, it's actually a bunch of blocks held together. Now typically what you're gonna have are either foundational failures or a uh, failure from extreme overtopping. And I say extreme overtopping because a properly designed gravity dam can take quite a bit of overtopping several meters or more, um, and some uh, historical dam failures have shown dams to withstand uh, way more than that, in fact. Uh, but if it's under-designed, under like you see in the photograph on the bottom left, that's Austin Dam in Pennsylvania, uh, it doesn't even need to overtop before it may shift or slide or even topple a little bit. For arch dams, uh, again, I mentioned before that uh, the characteristic, the defining characteristic of an arch dam is that it translates the force of the reservoir into the abutments. So as a result, it can be very thin and arch dams typically are very thin structures. Um, all the force is translated to the abutment and what that means when we're talking about a dam failure is that if you compromise the strength of that arch, if one of those monoliths is displaced, then the entire uh, strength properties of that dam go away, and it can lead to a complete and total failure of the dam. As you can see, Malpasset Dam in France, uh, almost the entire section is gone. Just a little bit of the concrete around the uh, foundation was left behind. Embankment dams are gonna be primarily erosional. Um, typically, these are earth or rock-filled dams. And uh, the failure mechanism for an embankment dam is either going to be overtopping, erosion from the top down, or piping from some weakness inside of the dam where you get uh, seepage through the dam itself and it opens up a, a hole in the dam which will then eventually collapse the dam and uh, form the breach.
<clears throat> over on the top right, you can see uh, a schematic that's provided in the uh, HECs using HECRAS for dam break studies. It shows you an example of how embankment dams typically erode. And uh, what's interesting is when it starts to overtop, you'll first see the erosion at the toe of the dam and it typically works its way up towards the top or towards the crest in um, more of a, a kind of a mass wasting um, type failure as opposed to um, typical sediment transport kind of layer erosion. There are several guidelines out there. These are just a few of the ones that I use. Uh, every country, every state, every province probably has its own or at least uh, uh, adopts others that are out there. Um, these again are some of the ones that I use, but these are just broad ranges of different types of breach parameters. For example, average breach width, the side slopes, failure time, for different types of dams. And uh, typically what I'll do is I'll use these to guide how I set up my um, failures of concrete dams. But what I'll use for earth embankment dams, I'll show you on the next slide, are breach parametric equations. And then I come to the guidelines just to make sure that I'm in the right range. And so here's some parametric equations, just a few, and there's several more out there uh, available for you to use. But these allow you to um, determine or to estimate the size, shape, and formation time of the breach opening for an embankment dam based on simple characteristics of the dam in the reservoir, i.e. the height of dam or the volume of the reservoir, and maybe a few coefficients describing the types of dams here and there. Again, several of these equations exist. It's very important that you know how they were developed and if they fit the dam that you're actually breaching. Okay, because they don't, not all these equations fit every single dam out there and every dam is unique. So it's important that you review these equations before you use them. Tony Wall's paper is an excellent resource for this because he summarizes um, many of the commonly used breach parametric equations that are out there. And it'd be a great way to determine if this is gonna be an equation that's gonna work for your dam. Uh, also the Hydrologic Engineering Center's um, TD39 technical document is uh, another good resource that summarizes breach parameters out there. Now it's also important to know your site conditions. Just because the breach parameter equation tells you a, you have a certain width or you'll have a certain width opening, uh, doesn't mean you're gonna get that. You need to know uh, what's, what do you have at your dam? Uh, what does the foundation look like? Is there non-erodible um, rock below the dam itself? Is that gonna inhibit the degree to which you have erosion or breach opening? So here's an example here. The yellow trapezoid shows you a, a breach opening that was calculated with breach parameters, but if you look closely, you can see there's an unerodible or erosion resistant rock line that's gonna limit how big the breach can be. So it's important to check that before you adopt breach parameters. Now, physically based computer models out there, um, uh, NWS breach, National Weather Service breach has been around for a while um, and uh, it's no longer maintained by the Weather Service, but uh, there's a third party that has kept it going and even developed a GUI around it. Wind dam and HR breach are two other popular uh, breach models that will determine your breach hydrograph for you. Finally, I want to touch on probabilistic dam breach modeling. Uh, this acknowledges the extreme uncertainty in dam breach parameters and determining or coming up with a, a breach size, shape, and formation time. We really don't know what it is, but we can have a pretty good idea of ranges. And so I like to just uh, introduce this just briefly. Um, as a concept, I think this is a direction we're going, but instead of coming up with a deterministic dam breach, single breach outflow hydrograph, you can actually come up with hydrographs that represent different exceedance probabilities. So the 1% chance exceedance probability, 5% chance, et cetera. And um, this is gonna require automation of your software because it requires multiple thousands of runs, but it can be done and it is being done already uh, McBreach's software out there that does this with HECRAS and HR Breach, which I mentioned previously, also does this uh, in their breach model. So with that, I want to turn it over to Bill, and Bill is going to talk to us about routing this breach hydrograph in the downstream direction.
Can I can I just make a break, uh, Bill, just before we begin? Thanks so much, Chris. And uh, just wanted to see if we could just touch on a couple of these questions that are coming through. Is that all right, gentlemen? Uh, Cray as well. Um, uh, I have, uh, before I start those questions, though, I've just put up in the chat line uh, some of Chris's uh, work, his book, Breaking the Hecras Code, his um, uh, RAS Solutions uh, blog page. You'll see all that on the chat line. Grab that, and that'll be useful. But there's a couple of questions. One... Uh, at the very bottom there, you might see, uh, where has it gone? Non-Newtonian, uh, done that. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. I, 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 tried, I tried to answer that one. We may get Thank into that, that a little later that, because we're right. not, uh, specifically yep. talking about any software package here. Yeah, no, that's all right. Um, that's all right. Some items, we'll, 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 we can cover that in the Q&A. It's, it's a definitely a good question. Right. Uh, there's a couple here. Uh, Yesman, uh, Tahira Yesman from Canada saying, I'd like to learn about bridge overtopping modeling from this discussion. Is that, is that probably, is that going to be happening in this discussion? Yeah. I mean, as far as bridges, yes, uh, definitely. Uh, what, what happens with the bridges downstream, um, you know, normal floods might just go right through a bridge and back yep. up against it but a dam a dam breach wave can just take the whole thing out and and there may be some uh, opportunity to uh, take your bridge and give it a time function where the bridge is there for a certain amount of time or to a certain depth and then dynamically you remove the bridge um, yeah Chris or Bill you may have some uh, some comments about that as well but uh, sometimes you, you've got an obstruction that's only there temporarily and once you get to a certain level the bridge is gone and you need to be able to change your geometry um, to simulate the removal or the failure of that bridge because it will behave very similar to a dam or a weir. Yeah, it's it's a it's a good question. Um, bridges downstream, uh, certainly nobody knows for sure if it's going to fail, if it's going to wash away, and if it does, when during the event will it will it happen? But it does have an impact on the attenuation of the flood wave as well as the amount of flooding upstream of the bridge. And so, a lot of times, we'll model both. If we're looking at maximum attenuation, we'll leave the bridge in place, um, and that's going to uh, cause more flooding upstream. But then if we're looking for damages downstream of the bridge, we may remove the bridge and look for maximum damages that way. Great. Look, um, should we press on? Uh, the time is uh, burning away. There are a lot more questions. We'll come to them. Why don't we move straight on now to you, Bill, and, um, and uh, 15 minutes, and then we'll crack into that Q&A uh, straight after that. So thanks for hanging in there, everybody. See you all there. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, over to you, Bill. Thanks, uh, Chris and Cray and Trevor. It was an excellent, um, excellent introduction. So I'll just bring up the um, presentation. Hopefully everyone can see that. Coming on. There we go. Yep. All good. That's great. Yeah. Yep. Well, thanks everyone for dialing in. This is a pretty exciting topic. Um, today I'm going to be talking about um, the solver or the, the processes that we're trying to solve and how we might go about solving that. Um, and also touch on some important issues such as mesh convergence. Uh, and then briefly have a little case study at the end to finish off with. So that equation you can see on the screen there is effectively the, the nasty one, the momentum equation. And all those different processes uh, what are often required by coastal models and a lot, a lot of these 2D schemes originated out of the coastal world, and they're just trying to solve velocity over time and, and all these other things are influencing how the water moves around. Um, for dam breach routing, we can pretty well rule out Coriolis force, which is Earth's rotation, atmospheric pressure, external forces. Things like wind won't have much effect on a, on a dam breach. And so we're left with those other ones, and you definitely need inertia, uh, otherwise you won't get that satiating as Cray was showing earlier. Um, you need gravity, otherwise water won't go downhill, uh, which is a fairly fundamental part of dam breach routing. Uh, bed resistance, of course, most, that's, people mostly think about that as Manning's end, but it can also include other energy losses as well. And our turbulence or eddy viscosity is often needed because we're talking about very complex flows. Um, more benign flows, more gentle flows, um, you can possibly get away without that last term. So how do we know that we need all those terms? Um, well, it's just simply through uh, benchmarking to theory and to flume tests. And if you have a calibration data set, often um, helps. So this is a good little exercise. This is a flume model um, out of Belgium, simulating a reservoir where they remove a gate and they're looking at the water flowing against um, a building. And so what happens is that a hydraulic jump forms in front of the building, you get a wake behind the building, you have supercritical flow in that red region, 
And it's, yeah, it's a pretty nice little study. They, they had um, a number of gauges um, around the building. And we're just showing here an animation from one of the uh, two flow simulations of this flume test. It's about three and a half meters wide. You see the hydraulic jump slowly propagates upstream, which is an interesting um, uh, uh, bit of phenomena. So I'd like to show this one. Um, so we're looking at two identical simulations, except for one thing that's different. And I tend to ask the audience who, which one is more, which one is least wrong, which one is more correct. And I won't impose that on you today, but by and large, most people actually say the bottom one is, um, is the more correct one. But uh, if you thought that, you'd be wrong. So in the difference between the two, simply the um, turbulence term is switched on in the top one and switched off in the bottom one. So the bottom one may look pretty, um, pretty amazing, but it's actually not close to what was measured in any shape or form. And how do we know that? We just simply compare with the measurements. So here we have one of the gauges, gauge one. Um, what you're seeing on the screen there is water level on the top left, uh, velocity of the water on the bottom left. Uh, the, the black line is what was actually measured uh, at that gauge. And the red one is the one with the eddy viscosity turned off. So you can see it's, 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 it's quite jumpy, as you would expect. There's no, no viscous forces in play. Um, and yeah, very sensitive, but not at all close to what was measured. Um, the blue line is the one with eddy viscosity turned on, and you can see it gives a, a much better production. We can look at location two. This is an interesting one because we have the hydraulic jump passing through this gauge. That's why you get that big increase in water level around about eight to nine seconds. And you can see the one with eddy viscosity turned off didn't come close to reproducing that, um, that situation. And location three is another example there. So it's through this benchmarking and so forth that we know whether these schemes work well, or what sort of parameters we need to use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what this exercise does, does tell us is that we do need that turbulence term in this sort of complex hydraulics. The other strong message here that I'd really like to stress to everyone is that you really have to be aware of the cool animation because it can be completely wrong. Um, yeah, so don't always believe a pretty picture. Oh, I'll just talk briefly about the mathematical solution. Um, what we're effectively trying to do is solve velocity over time. Uh, that was our last calculation shown there in green. And we don't know the exact answer. If we knew the exact answer, we wouldn't have such um, complicated mathematics going on and uh, we wouldn't have so, so many variations between solution schemes. So we don't know the next answer in one time step when we go from one time step from the green to the orange. Um, a first order scheme is the most simple approach and it's, uh, the analogy is effectively it's uh, making a linear a solution or linear attempt to get to that point in time. And you know, it will never hit the mark exactly unless things are very, very like in steady state conditions or something like that. Um, second order schemes tend to, the analogy is like solving a polynomial fit to what's going on and you'll tend to be much closer to the mark each time. The consequences of this is that uh, that error that's created uh, can cause numerical diffusion, which, you know, if I would have a layperson's uh, term of that, it would be a rounding or blurring of results. So first order solutions tend to exhibit that numerical diffusion. Um, we've got on the bottom left there, a snapshot of some of that, that last animation I showed without the turbulence term. Um, and as you would have noticed, it's got quite sharp features. Um, yeah, there's no viscosity forces going on. Exactly the same um, simulation using a first order scheme. You can see that there's been a, a blurring of results um, and the viscosity of, of that, that numerical diffusion is sort of distorting the, uh, the answers. And what you'll tend to see in the time series is the blue line is what, from the second order scheme and the pink line is from a first order scheme. And you see, once again, that uh, more blurring or rounding of results. I'll just touch now on mesh size convergence. And what I'm talking about here is that, it's basically what resolution should our 2D mesh be to you know, get a good answer. And we have an image on the screen there. Now, some of you who are very astute may well have uh, worked out what it is already. And as we make that resolution of that image finer and finer, we start to head to where we think we're going and to get the right answer. But I should just say, sometimes things don't always 
work out how you would like them to be. Let's look at an example of this. So here we have uh, test five from the UK 2D benchmarking exercise. Uh, it's actually a dam breach. You can see the hydrograph there on the left. It's a 30 hour simulation. The model there is on the right. Um, the inflow, uh, the hydrograph is applied at the bottom left. Um, there's a number of reporting locations. We'll just focus on the more downstream ones at four and five. And uh, I should just say that there's no downstream boundary for this test. They just said, let the water all pond at the bottom end. Um, so this model has run through uh, a number of different resolutions and let's see how the results look. So this is your 10 meter case. So it's pretty fine. You can see the mesh here on the left or it's probably a bit hard to see, but it's a very, very fine mesh for this size model. Um, you can see the time hydrographs there at location four on the right, top right top and right bottom is location five. Let's jump to 20 meter resolution. So, so a little bit coarser and you can see the 10 meter and 20 meter almost give identical results, which is, which is actually great. That's what we're actually looking for. And what that means is that you could easily run this and study at a 20 meter resolution um, with no fear of having any distorted results. Um, let's move to 100 meters. So you'll see 50 and 100 on the graphs on the right. But you, on the left, you can see that that 100 meter resolution is starting to get a bit coarse. But you know, it still gives a reasonably good match compared to the 10, 20 and, and the 50. So you could possibly even do your study at 100 meter resolution. Um, move to 150 and we're starting to see some distortion at location uh, four. And as you can see on the top left, the, um, you know, the grid is starting to get very, very coarse. And so probably getting, going too far. And we go through to 200, 250 meters. And at 250, you know, it's clearly the mesh is way too coarse. And you can start to see that in your results. So that red line, which is a 250, is starting to deviate strongly from the others at location five in particular. So just to summarize, it's a good exercise to do for a, not maybe every study, but at times, if you're trying to decide on what cell size is appropriate. Um, we tend to like to have a minimum of four to five cells elements across your main flow paths as a minimum. Uh, anything less than that, you can start to have um, maybe a loss of accuracy. And from this little exercise, you can probably conclude that I could do my study at 10, 20, 50, or 100. And obviously, the, the larger the cell size, the, the faster the runtime. So that obviously kicks into the, uh, the decision making as well. Okay, I'll just now touch on a, a case study. Uh, this is a Fred Hay Dam in Queensland, uh, Australia. And uh, for this study, it was quite an interesting exercise. They applied 10 different methods as to what sort of flow. Uh, would come through the, the breach of that dam. Um, and as uh, Chris mentioned earlier, this, this is where probably nearly all your uncertainty is. I mean, which one do you run with? The ones on the left there tend to be um, uh, just estimating a peak flow or some you can generate a hydrograph from. There's a couple of high ones there. Um, yeah, so you know, if, you, if you're wondering where the uncertainty is in this, this type of work, it's probably mostly in how you derive your, your hydrograph. And I think the problem, ballistic uh, Monte Carlo style approach is going to be increasingly the way to go. Um, so I'd probably feel like that, that kid there if I was trying to work out which one to run with. <laughs> so, but what we'll do, we'll just focus on uh, the last couple there because um, as a bit, they're the two that were actually finally used for this study and just compare the results of those. So the first one was effectively a method used by the Queensland government um, to derive a hydrograph using a level pool type spreadsheet analysis, like, like um, Chris mentioned earlier. And so that was run and that, that hydrograph was applied downstream of the wall. Um, the other option, which was sort of increasingly people are wanting to model the whole thing in uh, 2D or 1D and actually breach the actual dam wall um, as part of that simulation. So this, this was set up in TwoFlow software to re reform or reshape that um, dam wall as it eroded. Uh, and we've, we've effectively followed the same breach uh, arrangement as for approach I. Uh, there's also a spillway which flowed until the water fell below the top of the spillway. Um, and that was just simulated using a 1D element inserted in the model. So this is a breach hydrograph that came just downstream of the dam. So uh, the spreadsheet approach is a red curve. 
and the black line is what came out of the, the, the 2D simulation. So actually remarkably um, similar in some ways, which is, which is good to know, um, given all the uncertainties. Uh, there's a few assumptions, of course, as Craig mentioned earlier, the, um, the spreadsheet approach just assumes a still pool. There's no um, gradient or um, there's no, um, you know, satiating or oscillating of the waves that will happen in, in the dam, whereas the um, 2D simulation has this reverse wave propagating back upstream and then oscillating throughout the dam. Also, approach, the second approach will take, out, take into account any tailwater effects, which might not call kick in until the lower um, you know, part of the hydrograph, but that will also be accounted for. Just looking at some comparisons downstream, so you can see the dam there on your left, and we have a couple of those two yellow dots, we'll just have a look at the hydrographs that came out of the modeling. So the top black line is uh, inside the dam, so you can see that's from the, uh, the 2D simulation. Um, the first set of dash lines is um, at the top on the left there, and the second on the right. So you can see both approaches um, aren't giving an overly different um, peak water level. And importantly for um, dam breach modeling, the, the arrival time is, it is different, but it's not demonstrably different. So when you have a lot of uncertainty in your modeling, it is a really good approach to model things with different approaches um, and just get a comfort zone that what you're doing is, is going to fit with other ways of solving the problem. Um, and, and the really nice thing about the, uh, the full 2D solution is that you can get some um, pretty cool animations, which of course are absolutely right, as I mentioned earlier. No, but you, while that may look pretty impressive on the screen, you still need to, um, you need to make sure that it's doing the right thing. So there's, there's the 10 methods. Um, the other method the Queensland government uses is this cube reach one, which is actually the highest one. I think they got a bit scared by that number and, and they went and did a bit more in-depth analysis. So as you can see, large uncertainty. Yeah, where do we go? You can probably rule those two out. The rest are actually probably surprisingly consistent, which is nice to see. So just to conclude, um, dam breach uh, flood wave propagation is actually a very complex free surface hydraulics problem you must take the view that no numerical model is right. And that's absolutely the case. No numerical model is right, but you must always try and minimize the wrongs. And you know, the big ticket items are good topographic data. If you fit garbage into one of these models, you'll get garbage out. Um, if you, you know, preferably if you are gonna model that um, propagation downstream, that, you know, the 2D full surface shallow water equation solutions are the way to go. You probably need the full suite of terms in there um, from a dam breach point of view, but you won't need all of the terms from a coastal point of view. Um, second order spatial solutions strongly preferred um, to pick up complex hydraulic situations uh, to avoid numerical diffusion. We also tend to find first order schemes overestimate the energy grade line. Um, yeah, the benchmark these solvers, you know, there's theoretical um, comparisons, uh, there's fluid models as I showed earlier, and Probably hard to find in, in the dam breach area, but if you've got any good calibration, yeah, make sure you use it. Um, check for mesh convergence issues. Uh, it's very important that you've got a sufficient uh, resolution in your 2D model if you're going to model these things. Compare different methods. Yeah, don't just uh, run with one method in this sort of business because as Chris mentioned earlier, there's a lot of uncertainty in that breach hydrograph. And watch out for the outliers. And finally, be, um, be very critical of those cool animations we're all showing you. Thank They're you. brilliant animations, Bill. That was an absolutely fantastic um, presentation from yourself and uh, from Chris and from, from Cray. The, the animations for a non-professional model like myself, not a model at all, actually, uh, they, they say so much. Um, before you go, Bill, before we go into a whole lot of other questions, there's one short one here from uh, uh, Daniel Adria. Is this a subgrid model? I think she's talking about the last, uh, he's talking about the last. Um, uh, uh, Subgrid, I'm not entirely sure. But this, it's a, those models you saw there effectively a fixed grid. So it's the same cell size over the whole model. And right. um, this one elevation of cell. We have, uh, next year, we're actually putting out the ability to sample at a finer resolution. So you basically have um, mm -hmm. fine features. And also, some of you may have seen out there on LinkedIn the quad tree approach where you can actually put finer cells down 
your main river. So that's actually up and working and we'll be releasing that next year. So pretty exciting space for mm. studies of this nature from our point of view. That's right. Right, there's a, there's a few things happening here. So let's just get right into this, Craig. Chris, if you could come uh, join us as well, that'd be great. Uh, there's uh, a person who could come on screen right now. Uh, that's um, uh, Pravin. Go on, another question. Let's, 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 let's move straight on. Uh, uh, the top question here, top voted question here is, I'm interested to find out more about whether modelling pipe failure in two flow is possible and what is the best way. Yeah, yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so actually pipe flow, um, uh, we're actually building that in at, and that should be in for next year's release, yeah. That sounds good. All right, that's an easy one. Uh, Cameron Hall, thank you for your questions. And uh, look, I should say before I even go any, any more with these questions is that some of the questions, thank you, Chris and Cray, you've been answering uh, written answers are offline. But if you, if, you, if you have a follow-up question or want to re-raise that question again, uh, by all means, let's do that. Cameron, um, hi, do you have any comment on relative size of breach for small reservoirs? I feel that the empirical approaches used in Freolich 1995 and more recent publications can have issues modelling peaks discharges when small volumes are involved. Yeah, and I think Chris has given that one a shot. So, Chris, you want to just uh, sum that up? Let's see what's going on there, Chris. It's Cameron Hall's yeah. question. Very top panel. I'll follow up. Yeah, that's Cameron. That's a really good question. Um, and all right, yeah. So, Cameron, good question. Um, and, and you're right. The uh, breach parameter equations are based on historic dam failures. Uh, most of them are on the larger size. The smaller ones we don't really hear about too much and so nobody uh, does measurements or forensics afterwards. So we don't really know a whole lot about it. Um, and that really touches on the overall uncertainty in what we're dealing with. Um, what I like to tell people is if you're not comfortable with the breach primary equations, if they're not working well for you, uh, I would certainly encourage trying out those uh, theoretical models uh, I mentioned three of them, but there's several more out there as well. Do a little research, and several of them are free as well, free to download. So you might want to give that a try. No, that's all right. If you could type your question out and send it through in a Q&A for a bit, that would be really good. Thank you. All right, we'll head straight on to Martin uh, Fernandez. Hi, uh, from Spain. We use the parameters of the laws. I realize the values are not always the same, but there's a Spanish software that has already been already studied these kinds of errors. Any comments on that, Gray? Uh, I'm not sure about uh, the parameter of laws. Any uh, Bill or Chris, you guys uh, know about uh, that? No, no, I haven't heard of that. Um, I'm not right. quite sure. All right, we'll come back to that offline. <laughs> That's okay. Adrian uh, Emilio, uh, hi from Colombia. Uh, I would like to ask one, does the type of fluid related somehow to the type of dam failure? Uh, thinking about uh, the, the massive landslide at the Vergent Dam in Italy. Yeah, and I think this one actually, you know, with the time left, I think we can categorize some of these questions. And there are quite a few questions coming through about the uh, the yep. fluid and the, the properties of the fluid. Um, and so maybe if you know, Bill and Chris, you may want to uh, each comment on this one as well. Um, we're talking generally about water and most software packages. Um, everything um, is Newtonian. And uh, if you want to look into non-Newtonian fluids and what happens when a tailings dam fails, what happens... Um, you, know, you saw some of those movie animations when the material that's coming downstream uh, includes trees and rocks and bridges and cars and other material, you know, how does it actually behave? Is it really water? And we might use some parameters to um, fake in how it behaves, maybe with the roughness, maybe with um, some other parameters, uh, turbulence coefficient or something like that. Um, but most software packages that model dam breach, uh, assume that it's water and, and that that's the material coming down. There are some others um, that will involve some sediment transport, some mud slurries um, and how that might behave coming downstream. Um, but that's a, a whole different ball game. So we typically uh, try to simulate things using parameters that we can adjust um, to reflect the type of fluid that's moving downstream. Uh, Bill, Chris, you guys want to comment on, your, on that one? It covers about four or five questions that have already been raised and answered. Yeah, I think you covered a lot of that, Cray, what I was gonna say. Um, I, I guess I would add that uh, modeling it as water uh, as opposed to a debris flow is typically gonna be more conservative. Uh, so if you're looking for a worst case scenario, then you might go ahead and assume it's water flow versus the uh, the high, more viscous debris flow type events. But if you're curious to see uh, the difference in how that water moves, I mean, it's very extreme. It's very um, visible. You can Google debris flows and see any number of videos online of 
mountain debris flows and they move a lot differently than water that's for sure so yeah thank you chris and craig probably answered that pretty well actually and um there are situations where you do move into non-newtonian flow and you know the, the package are, are increasingly allowing that to do there's something we've built in and releasing next year as well um but there, i think there's some very interesting complications with trying to represent that and it, just adds more uncertainty to the whole process so as Chris was saying just run lots of different tests um, get a feel for what parameters um, affect your results and try and research um, that uh, to try and hone in on a more accurate answer but you just got to be very cautious of uh, of your modeling yep okay that top question there now from Nathan Young in the US I see Westchester Philadelphia is uh, can you please comment on the reason as to why the diffusion wave equation set is often not appropriate not appropriate for dam breach modeling and why the full momentum equation set is the better choice. And I think that's one, uh, that's a specific question to Hick Raz and, and there, there's an equivalent, uh, I think um, two flows got its own equivalence here. And essentially we're looking at dynamic flows. I mean, it's changing very rapidly and um, being able to zoom in on the dam failure itself and maybe adjust your time steps so that when the dam fails, you've got some really fine time step and then uh, they get coarser as you go on. Um, that's something that's now available as well to, to help um, mitigate for some of the, uh, the, the uh, instabilities that would otherwise occur. Um, it's just because of the inertial terms that need to be accounted for with such a dynamic, uh, dynamic situation. Um, there, but um, you know, where your uncertainties are, uh, and I you see this other question, maybe we'll try and hit this at the same time. Somebody asked the question, you know, are your uncertainties worse right at the dam? Um, you know, and, and your uncertainties can be defined, you know, de determined by running some sensitivities to equation sets. And like Bill showed, a 1D, just in a, a spreadsheet based equation can sometimes do the trick. Um, it, it, and it might be close enough, might be within the same zone of, zone of confidence. And it's not, the, the question uh, that was asked here online was, um, on, on the chat line, was whether your uncertainties are worse near the dam or farther away from the dam and 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 that's a that's a very good question uh, what ends up happening is you might have certain uncertainties at the dam and and they look you know like like uh, in the breach parameters uh, that the bill was showing they look like they're they could be really far off but downstream you could be even further off the propagation of your flood wave and the amount of attenuation that that peak hydrograph gets as it moves downstream, you know, you could have uh, orders of magnitude difference in the amount of flow that comes down or in your uh, arrival times based on, you know, whether that even ever gets to you, that peak flow may attenuate long before it gets to you in your village or your town or your building it may actually be safe from this flow, depending on how it's routed stream. So that's a very tough question to answer. I'd say there's uncertainty everywhere, test it everywhere, test your breach parameters, test your downstream flood wave propagation, test the reservoir, um, you know, level pool versus dynamic. Test it all and uh, and and get your get your uncertainties. Um, Chris, Bill, uh, I want to comment on those. Yeah, so, certainly, Craig. Yeah, you, you you can't use the diffusion wave in this situation just because of the um, the, uh, the the dominance of the inertia and, and turbulence terms really kick in uh, when you have uh, very. What, what, what you might call deep flowing, low resistance systems. Um, yeah, you, you really have to have those terms well, well represented. I agree definitely with Bill and Cray on that. Um, I mean, the defining characteristic of diffusion wave with respect to the full momentum is its lack of acceleration terms. And if you don't think acceleration is an important characteristic of a dam breach flood wave, uh, you might want to think again. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely important. Uh, I always recommend people use full momentum when doing dam break studies, um, certainly in the primary flood path at least. Um, and then as far as the uh, Craig kind of touched on the uh, uncertainty at the dam versus further away, uh, one thing I do want to mention is there have been some studies that have looked at um, the coalescing of floodways that so they move further away from a dam. And if you look at uh, maybe two different sets of breach parameters that produce two different peak flows, the further you move downstream, the closer those peak flows will come to each other to a point, you'll eventually get to a point where you'll see no difference between the peak flows. Uh, but that could be several kilometers downstream before you get to that. There's one question here from Bonnie Bear, which has got this highest vote at this point. Is is there a rule of thumb for how far downstream stream you should build your hydraulic model? Yeah, there's a biggie. What do you reckon? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the rule of thumb is run your sensitivities, and if it's still sensitive to, uh, if, if your area of interest is still sensitive to the parameters there, extend it. 
So, I mean, that, that's my rule of thumb. You guys may have others as well. It's uh, all, check, check it, me, it, it, you know, for me, it's all, ex, it's all experience. I mean, uh, I've never found a, a, an equation, a, a rule of thumb or a, you know, magic bullet that says, this is how far downstream you go. And I think the more experience you have in doing these, the better your guess is going to be. Um, it certainly is a little bit painful to have to come back and extend it a little bit further down because you didn't do it far enough the first time. Uh, but with practice, you'll, you'll get better and better at estimating that, uh, just based on the characteristics of your stream and the size of your dam and reservoir and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just add in there. I agree entirely with all that. The, um, the main, it a lot depends on where your area of interest is. If it's, if you're looking at urban populations, you clearly need to be well downstream of them. Uh, with downstream boundaries, the main thing is that the boundary is not affecting your results in your area of uh, interest. So if you're really focused just downstream of the dam breach, you might not have to go very far. But if you're trying to represent the flood wave down through a series of towns and populations, um, you need to make sure you'd, you'd probably end up with a stage discharge boundary. And you need to make sure that's well removed from those areas of interest. So. That's been great. Look, we, we are almost reaching the hour mark here, and we are nowhere near the, the list of questions. You can see them there, uh, gentlemen, uh, as you fire down these Q and A. You could pick one if you wanted to to do a last one. But Craig, could if you picked a question out, what would you pick out first up? Oh, I think um, I do see that it's getting some votes on the um, the terrain resolution again. Um, yeah. Watch your grid size, watch your terrain, run your yeah. sensitivities. Um, that that may be important. And and I guess wrapping it all up, um, you know, this is something that we look at hypothetically. But um, you know, the, the, I saw an ankle presentation about the um, the ten worst tailings dam failures and in each case a engineer went to prison over these things and there has been loss of life so i mean this is something that we do um so that we can prevent it we watch these things fail and we simulate them so that we can avoid the actual occurrence of these things and it is very scary when you look out there at some of the dams and the condition of the dams out there you know if this happens in a big way it can be a massive uh you know massive loss of life and that's what we're trying to prevent the better we can simulate these things the better we can assess the risks and warn people downstream you know this is something that the world needs and we need to be able to do it better and take advantage of the hardware and the software out there i love seeing those animations bill it's great Great to be online with you and with Chris, with uh, experts yeah. in the field. Yeah. Um, happy to be involved in this. And um, yeah, let everybody do their closing comments because it looks like we're out of time. So thanks. Any I'll comments, Chris? Any comment, Bill? And then we'll leave it. Yeah, no, all good with me. I'll just uh, emphasize that importance of the train data. And I think uh, if you're after an accurate simulation, that question refers to a 90 meter dem resolution. You'd need to <laughs> probably be finer than that, unless it's a massive system. Yeah, you'd need much better data than that, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah, I just want to say thanks to everybody for joining in. And if you remember nothing else, remember the uncertainty, <laughs> extreme uncertainty with doing this kind and take appropriate uh, action to, uh, to deal with that. Okay. Thanks very much, um, everyone, for being here today. Thank you for, to Bill, to Chris, and to Cray. Uh, I do want to remind everyone that of the... Um, uh, of the book from Chris Goodell. You see it on the chat line there, Chris Goodell's uh, RAS Solutions blog page, uh, and that we have the Dam Breach Modelling course coming up in March, but also a flood, flood modelling the cloud webinar coming up in February. To you three gentlemen, so much appreciate your time and effort here today. Uh, and for everyone who's joined us all across the world, uh, it's been uh, an absolutely fantastic time. Hope we can see you again, uh, but for now, we'll say goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye, goodbye. Bye. Chris. Bye Bill. Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au.